Welcome to You've Got This with Sarah Hamaker, a podcast to encourage and equip moms along their parenting journey. Join Sarah each week as she interviews dads and moms like you and discusses the joys, challenges, and rewards of raising kids. Hi, and welcome to this week's You've Got This. I'm your host, Sarah Hamaker, and I'm glad you joined me. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Shirley Campbell. She, uh, Sherry Campbell. She is a nationally recognized expert in clinical psychology, an inspirational speaker. She hosted the Dr. Sherry Show for many years. And she has several books out, including But It's Your Family, Cutting Ties with Toxic Family Members. And welcome to the show, Sherry. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, Today's topic is kind of how to help anxious kids. Now, whether our kids have a specific anxiety diagnosis or whether they just have trouble with school or, or just social situations, I think all of us parents experience that with our children at one time. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm raising a, a daughter. She's 14. And so we, we go through in and out of our anxious periods. Yes. Isn't that the truth? I have, as my listeners know, I have two teenage daughters, a 14 year old and a 16 year old. And just the other day they were, you know, I could tell they were getting a little anxious. Uh, one of them is taking an AP course and she's like, yeah, my test is coming up. I could just tell as you know, her anxiety level is going up. So uh, first, do you have any like pointers or any, any things that we can maybe do as parents to kind of help our kids when they get that kind of maybe normal test anxiety um, for school? What I do with all kids is, is I think it's important just to encourage, mm. you know, create a safe space, encourage. If you believe in them, they are much more likely to believe in themselves. Optimal level of levels of frustration are 100% necessary for their growth. So as parents, we certainly want to protect them from massive frustrations, but we also have to trust that their resiliency is going to grow if they have optimal levels of frustration. So when our kids get beyond that, like a test, and they feel it's beyond, you know, their, their ability to handle, you have to definitely soothe and encourage so what would, I mean, what, are there any signs that our kids are maybe not ha- able to handle the anxiety with like a normal, you know, encouragement, a normal thing? Because sometimes I look at my, especially my teenagers, and I know they put a lot of pressure on themselves. So we try to, you know, kind of dial that back a little bit and just remind them that grades are not the be all end all. Um, but is there, is there some something that maybe we should be on the lookout for that maybe we might need to, you know, maybe seek, you know, a counselor or um, other tools to help them. The great thing about anxiety is it's usually pretty obvious. You know, Mm. depression's a little sneakier. Anxiety creates movement in, 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 in the body that the speech is faster or they're totally shut down. Um, They are, they tend to just sort of be avoiding things or they're crying a lot, you know, or mm. they're, they're just acting. It, anxiety is a little more noticeable. Okay. Panic can come. So when anxiety is there, that means fear is there. Mm. And the way that I define anxiety is that it's fear projected forward. So when we're anxious, we are actually anxious about things that are not currently happening. And so we are foreshadowing that something horrible is going to happen. Ah. I'm not going to get a good grade on my test. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going, this is not happening right now. And so those signs when we start to get panic and other things, you know, it's important to teach our kids to slow down and we can help them to do that. The best way to do that is to look at those signs, approach our kids. Hey, you seem like you're a bit anxious. Change their physiology. I will always have my daughter go get in the bath or I'll say, let's go walk the dogs. Mm. We'll go take a 10 minute walk. That little break alone pulls them away from the thought that they're having, that they're projecting forward into a doomsday situation and it kind of spot checks them. And it, it, my daughter after a 20 minute bath or a 15 minute dog walk can come back and be a completely different person in an anxious situation. Ah, I love that because that is so simple. And yet, Mm -hmm. when I think back 
um, you know, to how I've kind of handled it with my daughters and, and with my sons, they're in elementary school um, a little bit. I often will say, why don't you take a break? Why don't you step away? Um, and I guess I was doing it without any knowing <laughs> I was doing the right thing. Yay. <laughs> Yes, you were doing the right thing. Yeah, anxiety is, you. we can either make our kids more anxious if you drill your kid with a ton of questions. Mm. What's the test on? When it's going to be? You know, do you need to study? How much are you going to study? Can I help you study? I mean, if they're not anxious, you can certainly be there and do those questions. You should follow up your kids, make sure they're, you know, up with school and with their assignments and stuff like that. But when there's pure anxiety... You need to step in and help, help solve the problem. You know, for me, the other day I had to email a teacher um, concerned about this, concerned about that. When your kid feels like you're their ally and they're not having to do it all on their own and you hug them, you let them cry, don't punish a person who's anxiety. That's not going to work, right? Right. What you want to do is you want to bring value. How can I support you? What can I do to bring value? Let's say that your kid is missing assignments and they're crying. They're, they're already punishing themselves. You don't need to go in there and punish that and make that anxiety worse. You ask them, how can I help you? And what can we do to bring value to this situation? It slows them down. They begin to think about things and they kind of solve the problem with you, knowing they're not alone. They're not going to get in trouble. Right. Then once the anxiety situation is over, You understand what the missing assignments are. Your child's out of the anxiety. Now you can say, how did we get those assignments missed? What Mm -hmm. happened there? The child will explain it, but it's a non-punitive. You don't want to punish your children. You want to lead them. I love that. That's great. So just so so that I'm clear in my own own mind, because this is very helpful for me as a parent, um, if... What we want to do is help their brain to kind of calm down in that moment mm-hmm. and then initially solve the issue of the missing assignments or mm-hmm. get them on that. And then later kind of go back and revisit that when when they're not in that panic anxiety state to kind of go, well, let's see what happened. Was there a particular steps? You know, can you tell me and how and then guide them on how to correct that? Is that, is that a good? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah, because if we're like, well, why do you have missing assignments? Your your kid's crying in front of you, right? It's Mm -hmm. your fault. It's your responsibility to get those assignments in. You know, all of a sudden, this kid's hearing, I don't feel sorry for you. I'm not helping you. Right. Okay, so listen, the missing assignments, let's say the missing assignments were there. Okay, so deal with that. Help your kids already upset. Lead them. If you want to have great children, you have to be a great leader. And being Uh. a great punisher is not a great leader. Right, right. And there and especially when you can tell your child is already upset, already anxious yes. about the missing um the missing assignments mm-hmm. or that they forgot to study for a test and so they didn't do so mm-hmm. well. I I almost think that today's um instant knowledge about how they did on the test is I'm not sure it mm. helps our kids, um, you know, because when I took a test, I, it would be, a couple, especially in high school, it would be maybe a week before I knew what I did. So I could kind of forget mm-hmm. about it. And a lot of times, you know, especially if they take it on um, on a computer, um, they get that instant what they did right then. And I don't know, sometimes that can be great if they did really well, but if they did bad, I, coming on the stress of the test, this happens even in elementary mm-hmm. school here. You know, I just, I'm not sure that's really helpful yeah. for our kids. Cause well, further, the ability that parents have to go in and check their grades on the oh. daily. Oh, my and goodness. And then what's happening is the teachers are behind on putting stuff in. Mm-hmm. So the grade is not reflecting certain things. Or it says there's a missing assignment on there, but your child turned it in. The teacher hasn't gone in. I, I can't tell you how many parents have brought their kids into my office just irate about the Aries, you know, out mm-hmm. here it's called Aries where you go in and check the grade. Right, right. I don't think any of any of that's healthy. And the bottom line is as parents, we forget how many mistakes that we made. Yes. It's like we want our kids to be these perfect kids for whatever reason that is. That's actually not healthy. Further, the more perfect we want our kids to be, the more anxiety we're gonna cause. They're yeah. human beings. Right. And the and the grade thing, yeah, I mean I, I 
we finally just, you know, opted out of like almost all the teacher emails because when my, when I, for our first went to, uh, uh, middle school, I mean, I was getting like, I felt like 20 emails a week, you know, mm-hmm. and it was mm-hmm. crazy because they had so many more different teachers. And I finally figured out how to opt out of the, because they were like, you have a test tomorrow. And they were emailing the students, but they the were parents, all, yeah. yeah, they got the parents. We somehow, I, I had to figure out how to opt out of all that because I didn't, because it was creating anxiety in me. Like I needed to say something to my daughter <laughs> and yeah. I didn't need to do that. You know, and so and we don't want to do things for them. Everyone complains about the millennial. Okay, so you start blasting parents with your kids schedule and emails and grades and when their tests are. Now we're having the same anxiety as our kids and our kid is getting pressure from everywhere. Also enabled everywhere. Yes. If they are given a test, write it down, study for it, pay attention in class, do it on your own. Yes. Uh Us parents, we have full time careers. (laughs) We don't need to be doing our kids' career, supporting that while trying to work our full-time career. And all our kids feel is pressure, pressure, pressure. Then they also learn, well, shoot, I don't need to pay attention to what my teacher says because my teacher is going to tell my parent. Now my parent can do it. Right, right. And sometimes... It's it's not good. It's not. And sometimes I think that um, the... The way the pressure's on the teachers to inform the parents, it's like we get Mm -hmm. co-opted into it. You know, Mm -hmm. I've had emails, oh, you need to make sure your kid studies this. I'm like, "Um, once they hit like fourth, fifth, sixth grade, even (laughs) after first grade, I'm like, once they're reading well, I don't think I need to be that involved because, I mean, I'm available, and I say that yes. sometimes parents think that means that I'm just like, hands off, don't talk to me about school. No, I mean, I'm available for them. I take an interest in what they're studying, but I'm not going to be like, did you do this, 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 and this? Because like you said, that just creates anxiety for the child. And mm-hmm. also, I have other things to do. <laughs> right. And it creates also a dependency on you. It's like yes. the kids go, well, shoot, my teacher's going to gonna tell my parents, so I don't need to pay as much attention. Right, right. Yeah, so that's not healthy either. I mean, part of, of, of learning to handle life is that anxiety is just 100% a part of it. Mm. We don't mm-hmm. have full control of this life. Anxiety is felt by every single human every single day for some reason. Yes. Right, because we, we, don't, we are not in control of this ship that we're driving here, right? So <laughs> life is its own unique thing. And so the more that our kids are given an opportunity to learn to lead their own lives with our support, with our guidance and with our protection, but with our leadership, then they will be more resilient. We don't want to raise a child that is not resilient, but dependent upon their teachers, dependent upon their parents to Mm -hmm. inform them on how to take every turn in life. Cell phones are another thing. It's like we have constant access to our kids where when I was growing up, there was a whole lot of stuff I had to figure out on my phone. I couldn't just call someone and say, how do I do this? Right. You know, there was a lot that I needed to figure out on my own. And um, that was an interesting challenge for me because I had to be more resilient. Mm -hmm. Whereas my daughter or her friends or anybody, they can do anything. They can find all their answers on Google if they don't feel like studying. You know, there's this Mm -hmm. access to our kids that we have that we can run their whole schedule for them remote. Right. They don't have to solve problems. And I think that, um, you know, what that creates, though, it, it, I think it does create more anxiety in them, right? Because if you don't feel confident mm-hmm. in your ability to navigate the world. 100%. It makes you feel more anxious. And that's why our millennials are where they are. mm Right, because one, they're they're lazy, and two, they all want a reward, mm-hmm. and and they don't really want to work hard because everything else or everybody else has been kind of supporting that system for them. So they go in to get a boss. They have no resiliency. The boss is expecting responsibility, and these kids think the world is unfair. Right, <laughs> right. You know, and now they have all this anxiety because they don't even have the skills to cope, and they're experiencing failure now. Mm-hmm. Right, because the world, real world, is going to give you some failure, and failure is healthy. Optimal levels of frustration are healthy. We learn the most when we are in pain 
because we don't like the way that feels. So we start moving, Mm -hmm. we start changing, we start thinking differently. You know, our kids need to not be perfect, but they need to be able to be, you know, human, having mistakes and learning experiences. And then you lead them through that. You don't punish them through it. Right, right. Because um, so often we forget that a large part of parenting is training, right? I yeah. mean, y- yes, we do need to do some correction. But yeah. if, if you know, one example um, that I often share with parents is, you know, your kid keeps doing the same wrong thing over and over and over again. And, you know, just telling him or her not to do it is, yeah. you know, is practically useless because most, you know, most of the time, 99.9% of the time, the child wants to change. They don't like yeah. making the same mistake or doing the same misbehavior over and over again. And yeah. But if we don't ever step back and go, oh, well, you know, we may need to, there's some training opportunity here to help replace that, what's probably become a bad habit with something more positive or to figure out why are they getting this way to replace mm-hmm. it at the root instead of just keep slapping band-aids on it kind of thing. That's right. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people first thing on, on medication is, you know, and, and, and sadly this is true that they just want to hop into, okay, well let's, let's get medication. Mm. Okay. So being a psychologist and working in lockdown units, I, I've seen the people who need medication. Right. I know what that looks like. And I'm going to say that 90% of people that are on medication right now and our kids are being medicated so young. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh-huh. And that's because parents aren't wanting to parent. Right. Right. So, so the people who truly need it, they're very different than the average person who just wants it. They want life to be easier. Mm-hmm. And then I get people coming into my office telling me their medication doesn't work. And I'm telling them, you know, it does work. But but you still have to live life on life's terms. I mean, I don't right. know what magic you think is going to go on in this pill, <laughs> you know. And then you'll hear kids even coming in, and I don't I don't treat young kids. I'll I'll treat about sixteen, maybe thirteen, the youngest and up. But they will actually say, "Well, maybe I could have medication." Mm. And I'm like, "Okay, because why? Well, because I think it would make things easier." Right. Okay, what's your evidence of that? You also see that these medications have all these side effects. Right. That, that they can cause suicidal thoughts and other things. You know, it's like they, but they're like, well, my mom takes medication or my dad takes medication. Mm-hmm. Okay, so where's the hard work piece of it? Yes. Right? If you yeah. want to learn to to be able to have some level of control over your anxiety, take action. Mm-hmm. Learn to work hard because there's a solution at the end of that every time. Yes. Yeah. And I think the more that we can encourage our children through, you know, the Mm -hmm. difficulties they have um, and, you know, help them to pick themselves up when they bomb a test Mm -hmm. or miss that soccer goal. Yeah, it happens. And better that it happens in our home when they're young. Yeah. So that yeah. they learn and build on those, then when we sh- we you know send them off to college and they mm-hmm. they can't cope. Um, yeah, I bombed a few tests in college too. You yeah, know? So me too. <laughs> what happens then is you you turn around, you go, "Wow, I missed something. Somehow I didn't get that. Let me make some time with my professor." But because you've had the resilience to figure out younger in high school or whatever, you see your parents calling teachers. You mm-hmm. you make time to talk to your teacher, etc. Now, all of a sudden, you have a skill. So right. when you bomb a test in college, you, you, you know that you need help. You don't just sit in an anxiety of like, I'm so horrible, I have right. to hide. Yeah. There's no way out. I'm going to die from this bad test, right? Mm-hmm. So there are ways that we can do this. It's, it's, not, it's, it, it's not a one-trick pony, right? So if we teach our kids the skills to solve their problems, by modeling what we do for them or how we do things for them, our kids develop better, better skills. Because kids don't do what we say. They do no. what we do. That is so true. And I think that's a great way to end our time here today. So thank you for being on my show, Dr. Sherry. 
You bet. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to You've Got This with Sarah Hamaker, and today's guest was Dr. Sherry Campbell. She's a nationally recognized expert in clinical psychology, uh, inspirational speaker, and her latest book is But It's Your Family, Cutting Ties with Toxic Family Members. Thank you for joining me this week. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast of You've Got This with Sarah Hamaker. Sign up to receive notification of new podcasts and listen to previous editions at sarahhammaker.com. Until next time, remember, parenting might be hard sometimes, but don't worry, you've got this.